Bill Goldstein here, the Kingscourt.com. Again, uh, you can always check out my music at the Kingscourt.com. A lot of people these days are listening to my music on the Pandora site. I noticed that. The numbers have gone up. So anyway, uh, but they're also at Spotify and other places like that. I'm changing the title of this. Um, <laughs> he calls it this, the, uh, it, I'm doing C.S. Lewis, Beer Christianity, working our way to the end of the book. And uh, he calls this the obstinate toy soldiers. And I tell you that because if you ever want to look up and read it exactly, it's in Beer Christianity, the ob it's uh, obstinate toy soldiers. Um, but he's really talking about from a spiritual point of view is the transition from uh, natural man to spiritual man. And that's really what it's about. So I'm giving it that title. And well, that was the 300s of the 4th century because he participated in um, Nicene Creed, so St. Athanasius, who is well known for saying, quote you what he actually said, God became man so that man might become God, with a small g. There's a part of um, the Christian uh, community that maybe not understand that. Um, they even find that offensive, uh, and yet one of the most important and influential people in Christian history, um, that's a quote from him. Um, and it's in the Bible. He's not misleading. It's just people see Jesus as God, which he is. We will never become God in the big sense. So it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> tricky. I noticed my last video, no one has hardly watched it because C.S. Lewis actually says that we become little Christ. Well, that, that might turn off a lot of Christians. Be, man becoming Christ, this is impossible. The idea is that we'll never be We'll be Christ in the sense, like Christ is a better way to say it. We'll be like Christ in the sense that Christ, because he took on human flesh, okay, in being God, and he participated in humanity, being the son of man, he elevated humanity to a godlike status. And it's the, it's the, Son of Man within him, which is similar or the same as us, um, that is that he elevated. In other words, he he lived the perfect life. He was the perfect Adam. He lived the perfect life. He was an uh, influence on humanity as to how mankind should live. And so he raised humanity to a godlike status because since he's taken on that human flesh, he will never abandon it in the sense. So whatever state he is in right now, we are elevated to that state. And in that sense, even though he's God, we're more like brothers, okay? And that's where the inheritance comes in. So that because, because we're now we're, we're raised to a divine sort of status in a <laughs> like in a, like I said in a, a small G okay so in other words all the perfection that he has um, and a lot of the knowledge that he has in our raised state we will have so that will be more godlike and so but that is in C.S. Lewis's own thoughts in miracles which is another book that I like to do or you know basically that's what it's all about and I think he even says that in here. That's what it's really all about, is that he's got, Christ has elevated that. And so this particular uh, one that I'm, like I said, the transition from natural man to spiritual man is all about that process, that transformation. So if there's not really a transformation happening in a person's life, if they're the same as they were when they first announced that they were a Christian, then one must ask, well, there was supposed to be throughout the course of your life a transition and a transformation to a higher level, becoming more God-like. Like I said, never becoming God in the sense. There is only one creator. There is only one God. You know, I noticed recently when I was listening to the scriptures that Jesus said, there is only one God. <laughs> Think about what I just said. 
you know, he said he's, he's, he, he said there is only one. There is only one God. Okay. So we think of the Trinity, we think of God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, um, but, he, but that's a whole nother talk. So this, um, so he doesn't quote, say that it's Athanasius. What he actually says, C.S. Lewis, is the Son of God became a man to enable men to become sons of God, okay? Which is the same, uh, J Jesus is the Son of God. So that's essentially the same as what Athanasius said. Going on with that, we, we don't really know how things would have worked if the human race didn't rebel against God. And when we did that, we effectively joined the enemy, okay, the dark forces, okay? So there are two kinds of life, and not only different, uh, but actually they are opposed. So he's talking about the spiritual life and the, the natural life, natural man and the spiritual man. The natural life is self-centered, so now he's defining it, it's self-centered, wants to be admired, to take advantage of others often, to exploit the situation, to exploit even the whole universe, get what you can. People stripping the environment and getting all the profit that they can possibly get out of it. And it, it wants to be left to itself so it can do its own thing. It's a kind of an isolated sort of self-centered, money oriented, money power oriented, dominating force. And it wants to stay away from anything that's higher than it because it's very proudful. So it would much prefer looking down at others than looking up to God. And it doesn't want to be in the presence of something greater than it because then it feels small. <laughs> and it wants to be better than everything else. So that's basically a description of you know, the natural man. When the scripture talks about the light exposing the darkness, so when it's in the presence of something greater than it, namely God or spiritual man, um, then it's, it's afraid of this light and it's afraid of the spiritual world. It's very content to just be on its own and do its own thing. It knows that if the spiritual life got a hold of it, um, that it would have to get rid of this self-centeredness and the self-will and <laughs> this would not be fun. And so, um, in, in other words, I meant that <laughs> to mean that it really wouldn't be fun for him anymore because all the things he really enjoys are in the world and a natural man, and he might have to have some sort of self-control instead of all the pleasures that he's used to getting into. And so in order to resist that, he's ready to put up a fight and uh, to do anything imaginable to avoid that. So did you ever think, and I was asking a question as a child, what fun it would be if your toys could come to life? So, so back to the idea that he wanted, he calls this the obstinate toy soldiers. So imagine turning a soldier into a real man. But suppose the tin soldier didn't like it. So what God did was, was really this, and, the second person in God, the Son, became human himself. He was born into the world. He became an actual man, the Son of Man, okay, within him. The eternal being who knows everything, who created the whole universe, the Son of God, now he's referring to, became not only a man, but a baby. A, and a fetus and a woman's body. And the result was that one man, who really was all that men were intended to be, um, so not, like I said at the beginning of this, you know, the perfect, perfect man, um, the perfect Adam, what Adam was probably intended to be originally, or was intended to be, um, he 
he became what we were in intended to be, the one man who had the power to create life itself. And so, that, so, and he allowed himself to be perfectly turned into the begotten life. The natural creature was taken up into the d divine son. So the part of Christ that was the son of man that was fully human was taken up into the divine son is what he's saying. The difficulty for us is natural life has to be in a sense killed. So it's in the scripture it says putting to death the old man. So that's what he's getting at. So when someone wants to become a Christian, part of that process is the transformation and putting to death the old man and all the desires and pleasures of the old man and turning the attention towards the spiritual man. Christ, who chose his in his earthly life to be a man of poverty, uh, makes me think uh, the foxes have holes the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. So he took on poverty, uh, misunderstanding from his own family, not all of his family um, really supported him, his brothers and sisters, and they not all really fully believed in him, although James, his uh, brother, um, who had a hard time with that, uh, but later on became one of the giants of early Christian faith after Jesus uh, was crucified and rose again. So, um, you know, there was betrayal by his intimate friend. He doesn't mention Judas, but that's who he's really talking about. He was mishandled by the, he calls them the police. <laughs> um, and, you know, and then there was the execution and the torture. And after being killed, uh, the human in him was united to the Son of Man and came to life again. So he's saying in that that every part of him came back to life again. Even the Son of Man, the human aspect of him came back to life in him. And that's super important because without that, we there is no resurrection for us. Because it's the resurrection not only the Son of God, but the Son of Man inside him that is what is giving, bringing to us eternal life. It's that resurrection. So it has to be the Son of Man had to rise. So in other words, you could say there, there is a man, a fully man, who has risen from the grave and is alive today. Amen. So the man in Christ rose again, not only the God. <laughs> I guess I'm in tune with this because I, I, I said what I said and then I read what I read. <laughs> so I kind of know where he's, he's going with this. So um, if, if we could see the past, there was a time when every man was part of his mother and or part of his father and part of his grandparents. So what he's, what he's saying is the whole, um, all your ancestors, you sort of existed in your ancient ancestors. That's why in the scripture somewhere in the Old Testament, it talks about God seeing, you know, somebody, I forgot who it was, in the womb, you know. He knew, knew him in the, <laughs> probably hundreds, hundreds of years before he ever really lived. So... So humanity is spreading out in time. It would look, and as it's doing that, it would look like one single growing thing, like a, like, sort of like a tree, you know, <laughs> which is interesting. It doesn't mention the tree of life, but like the tree of life. Every individual uh, would be connected with every other one. Individuals are not really separate from God any more than that they're separate from one another. The world is feeling, breathing, um, at this moment, uh, because God is keeping it going. If God wasn't keeping it going, this, who knows, the world would just instantly collapse. The universe would instantly collapse. He's keeping it all going. Christ began 
at one point to affect the whole human race in a new way. It makes a difference to all people who lived before or after Christ, even the difference to people who never heard of him. He's, he's saying, what Christ did on this earth has affected every person in the history of humanity. What is the difference is made to humanity? The business of becoming a son of God. Like I said in the last video, he calls it a little Christ. So those two are synonymous in his thinking. A little Christ, a son of God. And being turned from a created thing into a begotten thing. So that's God... That's, that's a very interesting statement. That's probably one of the most interesting statements I've ever heard him say. Um, turning a created thing, okay, into a begotten thing. So I gave the uh, talk before on begotten. What is be the nature of being begotten? Well, man be begets man and God begets God. If we are to become sons of God, then God, who has begotten one son, is going to beget other sons. Now, that really takes you out on a limb, which I don't want to go because I don't think anyone, any human know, fully knows the answer to that. They may think they know the answer to that. And to ask to how far that extends, um, I know that we will be like Christ and we will, we will rise and we will be God-like and in a sense have some sort of divine status. Um, but there is only one begotten Son of God. Now, whether there will be more begotten sons of God, like he's inferring, that's up for scholars to debate, and I don't think you could ever get an answer to that. But, um, but anyway, so that's what he's saying. It passing over from uh, uh, life that is... Uh, temporary and do a timeless spiritual life. So if that's what he means by it, yes, of course. Christ participated in the creation, or is the author of the, of the creation of the universe, the, the, the Word, or the, the, the Son. That's, it says that in the, in the New Testament, a creator God. That's, that, that's already been done long past. That aspect of God is God alone. But like I said, we're passing from the temporary into a timeless spiritual life. And that has been done for us. How has that been done for us? By the life of Christ on the earth and by his taking on human flesh, by his going to the cross, dying for our sins, rising again, the Holy Spirit being delivered to us for our salvation, to raise us to this status. It's the best deal that ever was offered in, in all of the universe. So people who turn it down, it's very sorrowful. Uh, humanity is saved in principle. What he means by that is Christ died for everyone. Christ died for you. So you are saved in principle. But it's, you're only saved if you accept it. It's a, a gift. It's being given to you. This, this is yours. You can have it. And, and if you don't take it, well... You know, I suppose that happens sometimes. Somebody offers somebody a real gift and they don't take it. We could not have done this for ourselves. It's been done for us. We have not to try to climb into this spiritual life because if we try to do it by ourselves, we will definitely fail. With the strongest effort, you will never succeed. Near the beginning of this book, I gave he had a part about that, about human effort. But it has already come down into the human race. So it's not us ascending like ascended masters um, up to God. It's really God, the descended master, coming down and getting underneath us and lifting humanity up. That's what it's all about. If we will lay ourselves open to the one man, meaning Christ, who this was all fully present, then because he is God and he is also a real man, I'm quoting C.S. Lewis here, 
he is also a real man. He will do it in us and for us. And it's like a good infection. One of our own race has this new life. I'll say those words again. One of our own race has this new life. If we get close to him, we will catch it from him. It's getting back to the whole idea of the good infection. Okay, We catch it from him by participating, by being around him. We People influence us. The more we're around certain people, we are influenced by them. So it's like an infection. We might even find ourselves picking up some of the traits of some of the friends that we have because they leave a mark on us. It's an infection. It's spreading. If you hang around with good people, you're likely to be a good person. If you keep hanging around with the, the druggies and the thugs, uh, then that's what you're going to end up. So you can express this in all sorts of different ways. Christ died for our sins. The Father has forgiven us because Christ has done for us what we could not have done for ourselves. I mean, it wouldn't do any good to die for ourselves because this, the penalty of the sin had to be paid. And the only way, the only person who could pay that penalty was God himself because he was sinless. So, when, that's why it says, there are, another way to say it is we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Um, Christ defeated death and rose to victory. And these things, all these statements are true.